Chapter 10 The house of Vinicius was indeed decked in the green of myrtle and ivy, which had been hung on the walls and over the doors, the columns were wreathed with grape vine. In the atrium, which was closed above by a purple woolen cloth as protection from the night cold, it was as clear as in daylight. Eight and twelve flamed lamps were burning, these were like vessels, trees, animals, birds, or statues, holding cups filled with perfumed olive oil, lamps of alabaster, marble or gilded Corinthian bronze, not so wonderful as that famed candlestick used by Nero and taken from the Temple of Apollo, but beautiful and made by famous masters. Some of the lights were shaded by Alexandrian glass, or transparent stuffs from the Indus, of red, blue, yellow, or violet color, so that the whole atrium was filled with many colored rays. Everywhere was given out the odor of nard, to which Venetius had grown used and which he had learned to love in the Orient. The depths of the house, in which the forms of male and female slaves were mavmg, gleamed also with light. In the triclinium a table was laid for four persons. At the feast were to sit, besides Venetius and Lygia, Petronius and Chrysothemis. Venetius had followed in everything the words of Petronius, who advised him not to go for Lygia, but to send Addisness with the permission obtained from Caesar, to receive her himself in the house receive her with friendliness and even with marks of honor. Thou wert drunk yesterday, said he, I saw thee. Thou didst act with her like a quarryman from the Alban hills. Be not over-insistent, and remember that one should drink good wine slowly. Note too that it is sweet to desire, but sweeter to be desired. Chrysothemis had her own and a somewhat different opinion on this point, but Petronius, calling her his vestal and his dove, began to explain the difference which must exist between a trained charioteer of the circus and the youth who sits on the quadriga for the first time. Then, turning to Vinicius, he continued, Win her confidence, make her joyful, be magnanimous. I have no wish to see a gloomy feast. Swear to her, by Hades even, that thou wilt return her to Pomponia, and it will be thy affair that tomorrow she prefers to stay with thee. Then pointing to Chrysothemis, he added, for five years I have acted thus more or less with this timid dove, and I cannot complain of her harshness. Chrysothemis struck him with her fan of peacock feathers, and said, But I did not resist, thou satyr, out of consideration for my predecessor. But wert thou not at my feet? Yes, to put rings on thy toes. Chrysothemis looked involuntarily at her feet, on the toes of which diamonds were really glittering, and she and Petronius began to laugh. But Venetius did not give ear to their bantering. His heart was beating unquietly under the robes of a Syrian priest, in which he had arrayed himself to receive Lygia. They must have left the palace, said he, as if in a monologue. They must, answered Petronius. Meanwhile I may mention the predictions of Apollonius of Tiana, or the history of Rufinus which I have not finished, I do not remember why. But Venetius cared no more for Apollonius of Tiana than for the history of Rufinus. His mind was with Lygia, and though he felt that it was more appropriate to receive her at home than to go in the role of a mermaid into the palace, he was sorry at moments that he had not gone, for the single reason that he might have seen her sooner, and sat near her in the dark, in the double litter. Meanwhile slaves brought in a tripod ornamented with ram's heads, bronze dishes with coals on which they sprinkled bits of myrrh and nard. Now they are turning toward the carina, said Venetius, again. He cannot wait. He will run to meet the litter, and is likely to miss them, exclaimed Chrysothemis. Venetius smiled without thinking, and said, on the contrary, I will wait. But he distended his nostrils and panted, seeing which, Petronius shrugged his shoulders, and said, There is not in him a philosopher to the value of one sestertium and I shall never make a man of that son of Mars. They are now in the Carina. In fact, they were turning toward the Carina. The slaves called Lampidrii were in front, others called Pedisequii, were on both sides of the litter. Addisness was right behind, overseeing the advance. But they moved slowly, for lamps showed the way badly in a place not lighted at all. The streets near the palace were empty, here and there only some man moved forward with a lantern but farther on the place was uncommonly crowded. From almost every alley people were pushing out in threes and fours, all without lamps, all in dark mantles. Some walked on with the procession, mingling with the slaves, others in greater numbers came from the opposite direction. Some staggered as if drunk. At moments the advance grew so difficult that the lampidrii cried, 
give way to the noble tribune, Marcus Venetius, Lygius all those dark crowds through the curtains which were pushed aside, and trembled with emotion. She was carried away at one moment by hope, at another by fear. That is he, that is Ursus and the Christians. Now it will happen quickly, said she, with trembling lips. O Christ, aid, O Christ, save. Atticus himself, who at first did not notice the uncommon animation of the street, began at last to be alarmed. There was something strange in this. The lampadry I had to cry oftener and oftener, give way to the litter of the noble tribune. From the sides unknown people crowded up to the litter so much that Addisness commanded the slaves to repulse them with clubs. Suddenly a cry was heard in front of the procession. In one instant all the lights were extinguished. Around the litter came a rush, an uproar, a struggle. Addisness saw that this was simply an attack and when he saw it he was frightened. It was known to all that Caesar with a crowd of attendants made attacks frequently for amusement in the Sabora and in other parts of the city. It was known that even at times he brought out of these night adventures black and blue spots, but whoso defended himself went to his death, even if a senator. The house of the guards, whose duty it was to watch over the city, was not very far, but during such attacks the guards feigned to be deaf and blind. Meanwhile there was an uproar around the litter, People struck, struggled, threw, and trampled one another. The thought flashed on Addisness to save Lygia and himself, above all, and leave the rest to their fate. So, drawing her out of the litter, he took her in his arms and strove to escape in the darkness. But Lygia called, Ursus, Ursus. She was dressed in white, hence it was easy to see her. Addisness, with his other arm, which was free, was throwing his own mantle over her hastily, when terrible claws seized his neck, and on his head a gigantic, crushing mass fell like a stone. He dropped in one instant, as an ox felled by the back of an axe before the altar of Jove. The slaves for the greater part were either lying on the ground, or had saved themselves by scattering in the thick darkness, around the turns of the walls. On the spot remain only the litter, broken in the onset. Ursus bore away Lygia to the Sabura, his comrades followed him dispersing gradually along the way. The slaves assembled before the house of Venetius, and took counsel. They had not courage to enter. After a short deliberation they returned to the place of conflict, where they found a few corpses, and among them Addisness. He was quivering yet, but, after a moment of more violent convulsion, he stretched and was motionless. They took him then, and, returning, stopped before the gate a second time. But they must declare to their lord what had happened. Let Gula declare it, whispered some voices, blood is flowing from his face as from ours, and the master loves him, it is safer for Gula than for others. Gula, a German, an old slave, who had nursed Venetius, and was inherited by him from his mother, the sister of Petronius, said, dash, I will tell him, but do ye all come. Do not let his anger fall on my head alone. Venetius was growing thoroughly impatient. Petronius and Chrysothemis were laughing, but he walked with quick step up and down the atrium. They ought to be here. They ought to be here. He wished to go out to meet the litter, but Petronius and Chrysothemis detained him. Steps were heard suddenly in the entrance. The slaves rushed into the atrium in a crowd, and, halting quickly at the wall, raised their hands, and began to repeat with groaning, a a a a a a Venetius sprang toward them. Where is Lygia? cried he, with a terrible and changed voice. A a a a Then Gula pushed forward with his bloody face, and exclaimed, in haste and pitifully, Dash, see our blood, Lord. We fought, see our blood, see our blood. But he had not finished when Venetius seized a bronze lamp, and with one blow shattered the skull of the slave. Then, seizing his own head with both hands, he drove his fingers into his hair, repeating hoarsely, Me miserum, me miserum. His face became blue, his eyes turned in his head, foam came out on his lips. Whips, roared he at last, with an unearthly voice, Lord, a a a a take pity, groaned the slaves. Petronius stood up with an expression of disgust on his face. Come, Chrysothemis, said he, if tis thy wish to look on raw flesh. I will give command to open a butcher's stall on the Carina. And he walked out of the atrium, but through the whole house, ornamented in the green of ivy and prepared for a feast, were heard, from moment to moment, groans and the whistling of whips, which lasted almost till morning. Chapter 11 Venetius did not lie down that night. Some time after the departure of Petronius, 
When the groans of his flogged slaves could allay neither his rage nor his pain, he collected a crowd of other servants, and, though the night was far advanced, rushed forth at the head of these to look for Lygia. He visited the district of the Esquiline, then the Sabura, Vicus Celeratus, and all the adjoining alleys. Passing next around the capital, he went to the island over the bridge of Phobaritius. After that he passed through a part of the Trans Tiber, but that was a pursuit without object, for he himself had no hope of finding Lygia, and if he sought her it was mainly to fill out with something a terrible night. In fact he returned home about daybreak, when the carts and mules of dealers in vegetables began to appear in the city, and when bakers were opening their shops. On returning he gave command to put away Gulo's corpse which no one had ventured to touch. The slaves from whom Lygia had been taken he sent to rural prisons, a punishment almost more dreadful than death. Throwing himself at last on a couch in the atrium, he began to think confusedly of how he was to find and seize Lygia. To resign her, to lose her, not to see her again, seemed to him impossible, and at this thought alone frenzy took hold of him. For the first time in life the imperious nature of the youthful soldier met resistance met another unbending will, and he could not understand simply how any one could have the daring to thwart his wishes. Venetius would have chosen to see the world and the city sink in ruins rather than fill of his purpose. The cup of delight had been snatched from before his lips almost, hence it seemed to him that something unheard of had happened, something crying to divine and human laws for vengeance. But, first of all, he was unwilling and unable to be reconciled with fate for never in life had he so desired anything as Lygia. It seemed to him that he could not exist without her. He could not tell himself what he was to do without her on the morrow, how he was to survive the days following. At moments he was transported by a rage against her, which approached madness. He wanted to have her, to beat her, to drag her by the hair to the cubiculum, and gloat over her. Then, again, he was carried away by a terrible yearning for her voice, her form, her eyes and he felt that he would be ready to lie at her feet. He called to her, gnawed his fingers, clasped his head with his hands. He strove with all his might to think calmly about searching for her, and was unable. A thousand methods and means flew through his head, but one wilder than another. At last the thought flashed on him that no one else had intercepted her but Alice, that in every case Alice must know where she was hiding. And he sprang up to run to the house of Alice. If they will not yield her to him, if they have no fear of his threats, he will go to Caesar, accuse the old general of disobedience, and obtain a sentence of death against him, but before that, he will gain from them a confession of where Lygia is. If they give her, even willingly, he will be revenged. They received him, it is true, in their house and nursed him, but that is nothing. With this one injustice they have freed him from every debt of gratitude. Here his vengeful and stubborn soul began to take pleasure at the despair of Pomponia Grisina, when the centurion would bring the death sentence to old Alice. He was almost certain that he would get it. Petronius would assist him. Moreover, Caesar never denies anything to his intimates. The Augustines, unless personal dislike or desire enjoins a refusal. Suddenly his heart almost died within him under the influence of this terrible supposition, but if Caesar himself has taken Lygia, all knew that Nero from Tedium sought recreation in night attacks. Even Petronius took part in these amusements. Their main object was to seize women and toss each on a soldier's mantle till she fainted. Even Nero himself on occasions called these expeditions pearl hunts, for it happened that in the depth of districts occupied by a numerous and needy population they caught a real pearl of youth and beauty sometimes. Then the sagatio, as they termed the tossing, was changed into a genuine carrying away, and the pearl was sent either to the Palatine or to one of Caesar's numberless villas, or finally Caesar yielded it to one of his intimates. So might it happen also with Lydia. Caesar had seen her during the feast and Venetius doubted not for an instant that she must have seemed to him the most beautiful woman he had seen yet. How could it be otherwise? It is true that Lygia had been in Nero's own house on the Palatine, and he might have kept her openly. But, as Petronius said truly, Caesar had no courage in crime, and, with power to act openly, he chose to act always in secret. This time fear of Papia might incline him also to secrecy. It occurred now to the young soldier that Alice would not have dared, perhaps, to carry off forcibly a girl given him, Venetius, by Caesar. Besides, who would dare? Would that gigantic blue-eyed legend, 
who had the courage to enter the triclinium and carry her from the feast on his arm. But where could he hide with her? Whither could he take her? No, a slave would not have ventured that far. Hence no one had done the deed except Caesar. At this thought it grew dark in his eyes, and drops of sweat covered his forehead. In that case Lygia was lost to him forever. It was possible to wrest her from the hands of anyone else, but not from the hands of Caesar. Now, with greater truth than ever, could he exclaim, V misero mihi. His imagination represented Lygia in Nero's arms, and, for the first time in life, he understood that there are thoughts which are simply beyond man's endurance. He knew then, for the first time, how he loved her. As his whole life flashes through the memory of a drowning man, so Lygia began to pass through his. He saw her, heard every word of hers, saw her at the fountain, saw her at the house of Alice, and at the feast, felt her near him, felt the odor of her hair, the warmth of her body the delight of the kisses which at the feast he had pressed on her innocent lips. She seemed to him a hundred times sweeter, more beautiful, more desired than ever, a hundred times more the only one, the one chosen from among all mortals and divinities. And when he thought that all this which had become so fixed in his heart, which had become his blood and life, might be possessed by Nero, a pain seized him, which was purely physical, and so piercing that he wanted to beat his head against the wall of the atrium, until he should break it. He felt that he might go mad, and he would have gone mad beyond doubt, had not vengeance remained to him. But as hitherto he had thought that he could not live unless he got Lygia, he thought now that he would not die till he had avenged her. This gave him a certain kind of comfort. I will be thy Cassius tree, the slayer of Caligula, said he to himself in thinking of Nero. After a while, seizing earth and his hands from the flower vases surrounding the impluvium, he made a dreadful vow to Erebus. Hecate, and his own household Lares, that he would have vengeance. And he received a sort of consolation. He had at least something to live for and something with which to fill his nights and days. Then, dropping his idea of visiting Alice, he gave command to bear him to the Palatine. Along the way he concluded that if they would not admit him to Caesar, or if they should try to find weapons on his person, it would be a proof that Caesar had taken Lygia. He had no weapons with him. He had lost presence of mind in general, but as is usual with persons possessed by a single idea, he preserved it in that which concerned his revenge. He did not wish his desire of revenge to fall away prematurely. He wished above all to see Octa, for he expected to learn the truth from her. At moments the hope flashed on him that he might see Lygia also, and at that thought he began to tremble. For if Caesar had carried her away without knowledge of whom he was taking, he might return her that day. But after a while he cast aside this supposition. Had there been a wish to return her to him, she would have been sent yesterday. Octa was the only person who could explain everything, and there was need to see her before others. Convinced of this, he commanded the slaves to hasten, and along the road he thought without order. Now of Lygia now of revenge. He had heard that Egyptian priests of a goddess Pasht could bring disease on whomever they wished, and he determined to learn the means of doing this. In the Orient they had told him, too, that Jews have certain invocations by which they cover their enemies' bodies with ulcers. He had a number of Jews among his domestic slaves, hence he promised himself to torture them on his return till they divulged the secret. He found most delight, however, in thinking of the short Roman sword which lets out a stream of blood such as had gushed from Caius Caligula and made ineffaceable stains on the columns of the portico. He was ready to exterminate all Rome, and had vengeful gods promised that all people should die except him and Lygia, he would have accepted the promise. In front of the arch he regained presence of mind, and thought when he saw the Praetorian guard, if they make the least difficulty in admitting me. They will prove that Lygia is in the palace by the will of Caesar. But the chief centurion smiled at him in a friendly manner, then advanced a number of steps, and said, A greeting, noble tribune. If thou desire to give an obeisance to Caesar, thou hast found an unfortunate moment. I do not think that thou wilt be able to see him. What has happened? inquired Venetius. The infant Augusta fell ill yesterday on a sudden. Caesar and the August Papia are attending her with physicians whom they have summoned from the whole city. This was an important event. When that daughter was born to him, Caesar was simply wild from delight, and received her with extra humanum gaudium. Previously the Senate had committed the womb of Papia to the gods with the utmost solemnity. A votive offering was made at Antium, where the delivery took place. Splendid games were celebrated, 
and besides a temple was erected to the two fortunes. Nero, unable to be moderate in anything, loved the infant beyond measure, to Poppia the child was dear also, even for this, that it strengthened her position and made her influence irresistible. The fate of the whole empire might depend on the health and life of the infant Augusta, but Vinicius was so occupied with himself, his own case and his love, that without paying attention to the news of the centurion he answered, I only wish to see Octae, and he passed in. But Octae was occupied also near the child, and he had to wait a long time to see her. She came only about midday, with a face pale and wearied, which grew paler still at sight of Vinicius. Octae, cried Vinicius, seizing her hand and drawing her to the middle of the atrium, where is Lygia? I wanted to ask thee touching that, answered she looking him in the eyes with reproach. But though he had promised himself to inquire of her calmly, he pressed his head with his hands again, and said, with a face distorted by pain and anger, she is gone. She was taken from me on the way. After a while, however, he recovered, and thrusting his face up to Octae's, said through his set teeth, Octae, if life be dear to thee, if thou wish not to cause misfortunes which thou art unable even to imagine, Answer me truly. Did Caesar take her? Caesar did not leave the palace yesterday. By the shade of thy mother, by all the gods, is she not in the palace? By the shade of my mother, Marcus, she is not in the palace, and Caesar did not intercept her. The infant Augusta is ill since yesterday, and Nero has not left her cradle. Vinicius drew breath. That which had seemed the most terrible ceased to threaten him. Ah, then, said he, sitting on the bench and clenching his fists. Alice intercepted her, and in that case woe to him. Alice Plautius was here this morning. He could not see me, for I was occupied with the child, but he inquired of Epaphroditus, and others of Caesar's servants, touching Lygia, and told them that he would come again to see me. He wished to turn suspicion from himself. If he knew not what happened, he would have come to seek Lygia in my house. He left a few words on a tablet, from which thou wilt see that, knowing Lygia to have been taken from his house by Caesar, at thy request and that of Petronius, he expected that she would be sent to thee, and this morning early he was at thy house, where they told him what had happened. When she had said this, she went to the cubiculum and returned soon with the tablet which Alice had left. Vinicius read the tablet, and was silent. Octa seemed to read the thoughts on his gloomy face, for she said after a while, No. Marcus, that has happened which Lygia herself wished. It was known to thee that she wished to flee. Burst out Vinicius, I knew that she would not become thy concubine. And she looked at him with her misty eyes almost sternly. And thou, what hast thou been all thy life? I was a slave, first of all. But Vinicius did not cease to be enraged. Caesar had given him Lygia, hence he had no need to inquire what she had been before. He would find her, even under the earth and he would do what he liked with her. He would indeed. She should be his concubine. He would give command to flog her as often as he pleased. If she grew distasteful to him, he would give her to the lowest of his slaves, or he would command her to turn a handmill on his lands in Africa. He would seek her out now, and find her only to bend her, to trample on her, and conquer her. And, growing more and more excited, he lost every sense of measure to the degree that even Octae saw that he was promising more than he could execute, that he was talking because of pain and anger. She might have had even compassion on him, but his extravagance exhausted her patience, and at last she inquired why he had come to her. Vinicius did not find an answer immediately. He had come to her because he wished to come, because he judged that she would give him information, but really he had come to Caesar, and, not being able to see him, he came to her. Lygia by fleeing, opposed the will of Caesar, hence he would implore him to give an order to search for her throughout the city and the empire, even if it came to using for that purpose all the legions, and to ransacking in turn every house within Roman dominion. Petronius would support his prayer, and the search would begin from that day. Have a care, answered Octae, lest thou lose her forever the moment she is found, at command of Caesar. Vinicius wrinkled his brows. What does that mean? inquired he. Listen to me. Marcus, yesterday Lygia and I were in the gardens here, and we met Pompeia, with the infant Augusta, born by an African woman, Lilith. In the evening the child fell ill, and Lilith insists that she was bewitched, that that foreign woman whom they met in the garden bewitched her. Should the child recover, they will forget this, 
but in the opposite case Papia will be the first to accuse Lygia of witchcraft, and wherever she is found there will be no rescue for her. A moment of silence followed, then Venetius said, but perhaps she did bewitch her, and has bewitched me. Lilith repeats that the child began to cry the moment she carried her past us. And really the child did begin to cry. It is certain that she was sick when they took her out of the garden. Marcus, seek for Lygia whenever it may please thee, but till the infant Augusta recovers, speak not of her to Caesar, or thou wilt bring on her Papia's vengeance. Her eyes have wept enough because of thee already and may all the gods guard her poor head. Dost thou love her, Octa? inquired Venetius, gloomily. Yes, I love her. And tears glittered in the eyes of the freedwoman. Thou lovest her because she has not repaid thee with hatred, as she has me. Octa looked at him for a time as if hesitating, or as if wishing to learn if he spoke sincerely. Then she said, O blind and passionate man she loved thee. Venetius sprang up under the influence of those words as if possessed. It is not true. She hated him. How could Octay know? Would Lygia make a confession to her after one day's acquaintance? What love is that which prefers wandering? The disgrace of poverty, the uncertainty of tomorrow, or a shameful death even, to a wreath-bedecked house, in which a lover is waiting with a feast. It is better for him not to hear such things, for he is ready to go mad. He would not have given that girl for all Caesar's treasures, and she fled. What kind of love is that which dreads delight and gives pain? Who can understand it? Who can fathom it? Were it not for the hope that he should find her, he would sink a sword in himself. Love surrenders, it does not take away. There were moments at the house of Alice when he himself believed in near happiness, but now he knows that she hated him, that she hates him, and will die with hatred in her heart. But Octa, usually mild and timid, burst forth in her turn with indignation. How had he tried to win Lygia? Instead of bowing before Alice and Pomponia to get her, he took the child away from her parents by stratagem. He wanted to make, not a wife, but a concubine of her, the foster daughter of an honorable house, and the daughter of a king. He had her brought to this abode of crime and infamy. He defiled her innocent eyes with the sight of a shameful feast. He acted with her as with a wanton. Had he forgotten the house of Alice and Pomponia Grisina, who had reared Lydia? Had he not sense enough to understand that there are women different from Nigidia or Calvia Crispinilla or Papia, and from all those whom he meets in Caesar's house? Did he not understand at once on seeing Lygia that she is an honest maiden, who prefers death to infamy? Whence does he know what kind of god she worships, and whether they are not purer and better than the wanton Venus? or the Nisus, worshipped by the profligate women of Rome. No, Lygia had made no confession to her, but she had said that she looked for rescue to him, to Venetius. She had hoped that he would obtain for her permission from Caesar to return home, that he would restore her to Pomponia. And while speaking of this, Lygia blushed like a maiden who loves and trusts. Lygia's heart beat for him, but he, Venetius, had terrified and offended her had made her indignant. Let him seek her now with the aid of Caesar's soldiers, but let him know that should Papia's child die, suspicion will fall on Lygia, whose destruction will then be inevitable. Emotion began to force its way through the anger and pain of Venetius. The information that he was loved by Lygia shook him to the depth of his soul. He remembered her in Alice's garden, when she was listening to his words with blushes on her face and her eyes full of light. It seemed to him then that she had begun to love him, and all at once, at that thought, a feeling of certain happiness embraced him, a hundred times greater than that which he desired. He thought that he might have won her gradually, and besides as one loving him, she would have wreathed his door, rubbed it with wolf's fat, and then sat as his wife by his hearth on the sheepskin. He would have heard from her mouth the sacramental, where thou art, keys, there am I, Gaia, and she would have been his forever. Why did he not act thus? True, he had been ready so to act, but now she is gone, and it may be impossible to find her, and should he find her, perhaps he will cause her death, and should he not cause her death, neither she nor Alice nor Pomponia Grisina will favor him. Here anger raised the hair on his head again, but his anger turned now, not against the house of Alice, or Lygia but against Petronius. Petronius was to blame for everything. Had it not been for him Lygia would not have been forced to wander, she would be his betrothed, and no danger would be hanging over her dear head. But now all is past, 
and it is too late to correct the evil which will not yield to correction. Too late, and it seemed to him that a gulf had opened before his feet. He did not know what to begin, how to proceed, whither to betake himself. Octay repeated as an echo the words, too late, which from another's mouth sounded like a death sentence. He understood one thing, however, that he must find Lygia, or something evil would happen to him. And wrapping himself mechanically in his toga, he was about to depart without taking farewell even of Octay, when suddenly the curtain separating the entrance from the atrium was pushed aside, and he saw before him the pensive figure of Pomponia Grisina. Evidently she too had heard of the disappearance of Lygia, and, judging that she could see Octay more easily than Alice, had come for news to her. But, seeing Vinicius, she turned her pale, delicate face to him, and said, after a pause, May God forgive thee the wrong, Marcus which thou hast done to us and to Lygia. He stood with drooping head, with a feeling of misfortune and guilt, not understanding what God was to forgive him or could forgive him. Pomponia had no cause to mention forgiveness, she ought to have spoken of revenge. At last he went out with a head devoid of counsel, full of grievous thoughts, immense care, and amazement. In the court and under the gallery were crowds of anxious people. Among slaves of the palace were knights and senators who had come to inquire about the health of the infant, and at the same time to show themselves in the palace, and exhibit a proof of their anxiety, even in presence of Nero's slaves. News of the illness of the divine had spread quickly it was evident, for new forms appeared in the gateway every moment, and through the opening of the arcade whole crowds were visible. Some of the newly arrived seeing that Vinicius was coming from the palace, attacked him for news, but he hurried on without answering their questions, till Petronius, who had come for news too, almost struck his breast and stopped him. Beyond doubt Vinicius would have become enraged at sight of Petronius, and let himself do some lawless act in Caesar's palace, had it not been that when he had left Octay he was so crushed, so weighed down and exhausted, that for the moment even his innate irascibility had left him. He pushed Petronius aside and wished to pass, but the other detained him, by force almost. How is the divine infant? asked he. But this constraint angered Venetius a second time, and roused his indignation in an instant. May Hades swallow her and all this house, said he, gritting his teeth. Silence, hapless man, said Petronius, and looking around he added hurriedly, If thou wish to know something of Lygia, come with me. I will tell nothing here. Come with me, I will tell my thoughts in the litter. And putting his arm around the young tribune, he conducted him from the palace as quickly as possible. That was his main concern, for he had no news whatever, but being a man of resources, and having, in spite of his indignation of yesterday, much sympathy for Venetius, and finally feeling responsible for all that had happened, he had undertaken something already and when they entered the litter he said, I have commanded my slaves to watch at every gate. I gave them an accurate description of the girl, and that giant who bore her from the feast at Caesar's, for he is the man, beyond doubt, who intercepted her. Listen to me, perhaps Alice and Pomponia wish to secrete her in some estate of theirs, in that case we shall learn the direction in which they took her. If my slaves do not see her at some gate, we shall know that she is in the city yet, and shall begin this very day to search in Rome for her. Alice does not know where she is, answered Venetius. Art thou sure of that? I saw Pomponia. She too is looking for her. She could not leave the city yesterday, for the gates are closed at night. Two of my people are watching at each gate. One is to follow Lygia and the giant, the other to return at once and inform me. If she is in the city, we shall find her, for that Lygian is easily recognized even by his stature and his shoulders. Thou art lucky that it was not Caesar who took her, and I can assure thee that he did not, for there are no secrets from me on the Palatine. But Venetius burst forth in sorrow still more than in anger, and in a voice broken by emotion told Petronius what he had heard from Octae, and what new dangers were threatening Lygia, dangers so dreadful that because of them there would be need to hide her from Poppia most carefully in case they discovered her. Then he reproached Petronius bitterly for his counsel. Had it not been for him, everything would have gone differently. Lygia would have been at the house of Alice, and he, Venetius, might have seen her every day, and he would have been happier at that moment than Caesar. And carried away as he went on with his narrative, he yielded more and more to emotion, till at last tears of sorrow and rage began to fall from his eyes. 
Petronius, who had not even thought that the young man could love and desire to such a degree, when he saw the tears of despair said to himself, with a certain astonishment, O mighty lady of Cyprus, thou alone art ruler of gods and men. Chapter 12 When they alighted in front of the arbiter's house, the chief of the atrium answered them that of slaves sent to the gates none had returned yet. The Atriensis had given orders to take food to them, and a new command, that under penalty of rods they were to watch carefully all who left the city. Thou sest, said Petronius, that they are in Rome, beyond doubt, and in that case we shall find them. But command thy people also to watch at the gates, those, namely, who were sent for Lygia, as they will recognize her easily. I have given orders to send them to rural prisons, said Venetius, but I will recall the orders at once, and let them go to the gates. And writing a few words on a wax-covered tablet, he handed it to Petronius, who gave directions to send it at once to the house of Venetius. Then they passed into the interior portico, and, sitting on the marble bench, began to talk. The golden-haired Eunice and Iris pushed bronze foot tools under their feet, and poured wine for them into goblets, out of wonderful narrow-necked pitchers from Valletra and Cicina. Hast thou among thy people any one who knows that giant Lygian? asked Petronius. Addisness and Gulo knew him, but Addisness fell yesterday at the litter, and Gulo I killed. I am sorry for him, said Petronius. He carried not only thee, but me, in his arms. I intended to free him answered Venetius, but do not mention him. Let us speak of Lygia. Rome is a sea. A sea is just the place where men fish for pearls. Of course we shall not find her today, or tomorrow, but we shall find her surely. Thou hast accused me just now of giving thee this method, but the method was good in itself, and became bad only when turned to bad. Thou hast heard from Malice himself, that he intends to go to Sicily with his whole family. In that case the girl would be far from thee. I should follow them said Venetius, and in every case she would be out of danger, but now, if that child dies, Papia will believe, and will persuade Caesar, that she died because of Lygia. True, that alarmed me, too, but that little doll may recover. Should she die, we shall find some way of escape. Here Petronius meditated a while and added, Papia, it is said, follows the religion of the Jews and believes in evil spirits. Caesar is superstitious. If we spread the report that evil spirits carried off Lygia, the news will find belief, especially as neither Caesar nor Alice Plautius intercepted her, her escape was really mysterious. The Lygian could not have effected it alone, he must have had help. And where could a slave find so many people in the course of one day? Slaves help one another in Rome. Some person pays for that with blood at times. True, they support one another but not some against others. In this case it was known that responsibility and punishment would fall on thy people. If thou give thy people the idea of evil spirits, they will say at once that they saw such with their own eyes, because that will justify them in thy sight. Ask one of them, as a test, if he did not see spirits carrying off Lygia through the air, he will swear at once by the Aegis of Zeus that he saw them. Venetius, who was superstitious also, looked at Petronius with sudden and great fear. If Ursus could not have meant to help him, and was not able to take her alone, who could take her? Petronius began to laugh. See, said he, they will believe, since thou art half a believer thyself. Such is our society, which ridicules the gods. They, too, will believe, and they will not look for her. Meanwhile we shall put her away somewhere far off from the city in some villa of mine or thine. But who could help her? Her co-religionists, answered Petronius. Who are they? What deity does she worship? I ought to know that better than thou. Nearly every woman in Rome honors a different one. It is almost beyond doubt that Pomponia reared her in the religion of that deity which she herself worships. What one she worships I know not. One thing is certain, that no person has seen her make an offering to our gods in any temple. They have accused her even of being a Christian. But that is not possible. A domestic tribunal cleared her of the charge. They say that Christians not only worship an ass's head, but are enemies of the human race, and permit the foulest crimes. Pomponia cannot be a Christian, as her virtue is known, and an enemy of the human race could not treat slaves as she does. In no house are they treated as at Alice's, interrupted Venetius. Ah, Pomponia mentioned to me some god who must be one powerful and merciful. Where she has put away all the others is her affair, 
it is enough that that logos of hers cannot be very mighty, or rather he must be a very weak god, since he has had only two adherents, Pomponia and Lygia, and Ursus in addition. It must be that there are more of those adherents, and that they assisted Lygia. That faith commands forgiveness, said Venetius. At Octus I met Pomponia, who said to me, May God forgive thee the evil which thou hast done to us and to Lygia. Evidently their God is some curator who is very mild. Ha! Let him forgive thee, and in sign of forgiveness return thee the maiden. I would offer him a hecatomb tomorrow. I have no wish for food, or the bath, or sleep. I will take a dark lantern and wander through the city. Perhaps I shall find her in disguise. I am sick. Petronius looked at him with commiseration. In fact, there was blue under his eyes. His pupils were gleaming with fever, his unshaven beard indicated a dark strip on his firmly outlined jaws, his hair was in disorder, and he was really like a sick man. Iris and the golden-haired Eunice looked at him also with sympathy, but he seemed not to see them, and he and Petronius took no notice whatever of the slave women, just as they would not have noticed dogs moving around them. Fever is tormenting thee said Petronius. It is. Then listen to me. I know not what the doctor has prescribed to thee, but I know how I should act in thy place. Till this lost one is found I should seek in another that which for the moment has gone from me with her. I saw splendid forms at thy villa. Do not contradict me. I know what love is, and I know that when one is desired another cannot take her place. But in a beautiful slave it is possible to find even momentary distraction. I do not need it said Venetius. But Petronius, who had for him a real weakness, and who wished to soften his pain, began to meditate how he might do so. Perhaps thine have not for thee the charm of novelty, said he, after a while, and here he began to look in turn at Iris and Eunice, and finally he placed his palm on the hip of the golden-haired Eunice. Look at this grace, for whom some days since Fontius Capiton the younger offered three wonderful boys from Glazomi. A more beautiful figure than hers even Scopus himself has not chiseled. I myself cannot tell why I have remained indifferent to her thus far, since thoughts of Chrysothemis have not restrained me. Well, I give her to thee, take her for thyself. When the golden-haired Eunice heard this, she grew pale in one moment, and, looking with frightened eyes on Venetius, seemed to wait for his answer without breath in her breast. But he sprang up suddenly, and, pressing his temples with his hands, said quickly, like a man who is tortured by disease, and will not hear anything, no, no, I care not for her, I care not for others, I thank thee, but I do not want her, I will seek that one through the city, give command to bring me a Gallic cloak with a hood, I will go beyond the Tiber if I could see even Ursus, and he hurried away, Petronius, seeing that he could not remain in one place, did not try to detain him, taking, however, his refusal as a temporary dislike for all women save Lygia, and not wishing his own magnanimity to go for a naught, he said, turning to the slave, Eunice, thou wilt bathe and anoint thyself, then dress, after that thou wilt go to the house of Venetius. But she dropped before him on her knees, and with joined palms implored him not to remove her from the house. She would not go to Venetius she said, she would rather carry fuel to the hypocostum in his house than be chief servant in that of Venetius. She would not, she could not go, and she begged him to have pity on her. Let him give commands to flog her daily, only not send her away. And trembling like a leaf with fear and excitement, she stretched her hands to him, while he listened with amazement. A slave who ventured to beg relief from the fulfillment of a command, who said I will not and I cannot was something so unheard of in Rome that Petronius could not believe his own ears at first. Finally he frowned, he was too refined to be cruel. His slaves, especially in the department of pleasure, were freer than others, on condition of performing their service in an exemplary manner, and honoring the will of their master, like that of a god. In case they failed in these two respects, he was able not to spare punishment, to which, according to general custom, they were subject. Since. Besides this, he could not endure opposition, nor anything which ruffled his calmness. He looked for a while at the kneeling girl, and then said, Call Tiresias, and return with him. Eunice roused, trembling, with tears in her eyes, and went out. After a time she returned with the chief of the atrium, Tiresias, a Cretan. Thou wilt take Eunice, said Petronius, and give her five and twenty lashes, in such fashion, however, 
as not to harm her skin. When he had said this, he passed into the library, and, sitting down at a table of rose-colored marble, began to work on his feast of trimalchion. But the flight of Lygia and the illness of the infant Augusta had disturbed his mind so much that he could not work long. That illness, above all, was important. It occurred to Petronius that were Caesar to believe that Lygia had cast spells on the infant, the responsibility might fall on him also, for the girl had been brought at his request to the palace, but he could reckon on this that at the first interview with Caesar he would be able in some way to show the utter absurdity of such an idea, he counted a little, too, on a certain weakness which Papia had for him, a weakness hidden carefully, it is true, but not so carefully that he could not divine it. After a while he shrugged his shoulders at these fears, and decided to go to the Triclinium to strengthen himself, and then order the litter to bear him once more to the palace, after that to the Campus Martius, and then to Chrysothemis. But on the way to the Triclinium at the entrance to the corridor assigned to servants, he saw unexpectedly the slender form of Eunice standing, among other slaves, at the wall, and forgetting that he had given Tiresias no order beyond flogging her, he wrinkled his brow again, and looked around for the Atriensis. Not seeing him among the servants, he turned to Eunice. Hast thou received the lashes? She cast herself at his feet a second time, pressed the border of his toga to her lips and said, Oh, yes, Lord, I have received them. Oh, yes, Lord. In her voice were heard, as it were, joy and gratitude. It was clear that she looked on the lashes as a substitute for her removal from the house, and that now she might stay there. Petronius, who understood this, wondered at the passionate resistance of the girl, but he was too deeply versed in human nature not to know that love alone could call forth such resistance. Dost thou love someone in this house? asked he. She raised her blue, tearful eyes to him, and answered, in a voice so low that it was hardly possible to hear her, Yes, Lord. And with those eyes, with that golden hair thrown back, with fear and hope in her face, she was so beautiful, she looked at him so entreatingly, that Petronius, who, as a philosopher, had proclaimed the might of love, and who, as a man of aesthetic nature, had given homage to all beauty, felt for her a certain species of compassion. Whom of those dost thou love? inquired he, indicating the servants with his head. There was no answer to that question. Eunice inclined her head to his feet and remained motionless. Petronius looked at the slaves, among whom were beautiful and stately youths. He could read nothing on any face, on the contrary, all had certain strange smiles. He looked then for a while on Eunice lying at his feet and went in silence to the Triclinium. After he had eaten, he gave command to bear him to the palace, and then to Chrysothemis, with whom he remained till late at night. But when he returned, he gave command to call Tiresias. Did Eunice receive the flogging? inquired he. She did, Lord. Thou didst not let the skin be cut, however. Did I give no other command touching her? No, Lord, answered the Atriensis with alarm. That is well. Whom of the slaves does she love? No one, Lord. What dost thou know of her? Tiresias began to speak in a somewhat uncertain voice. At night Eunice never leaves the cubiculum in which she lives with old Acrisna and Ephida. After thou art dressed she never goes to the bathrooms. Other slaves ridicule her, and call her Diana. Enough, said Petronius. My relative, Venetius, to whom I offered her today, did not accept her. Hence she may stay in the house. Thou art free to go. Is it permitted me to speak more of Eunice, Lord? I have commanded thee to say all thou knowest. The whole familia are speaking of the flight of the maiden who was to dwell in the house of the noble Venetius. After thy departure, Eunice came to me and said that she knew a man who could find her. Ah, what kind of man is he? I know not, Lord, but I thought that I ought to inform thee of this matter. That is well. Let that man wait tomorrow in my house for the arrival of the tribune whom thou wilt request in my name to meet me here. The Atriensis bowed and went out. But Petronius began to think of Eunice. At first it seemed clear to him that the young slave wished Venetius to find Lygia for this reason only, that she would not be forced from his house. Afterward, however, it occurred to him that the man whom Eunice was pushing forward might be her lover, and all at once that thought seemed to him disagreeable. There was, it is true, a simple way of learning the truth for it was enough to summon Eunice, but the hour was late. Petronius felt tired after his long visit with Chrysothemis, 
and was in a hurry to sleep. But on the way to the cubiculum he remembered it is unknown why that he had noticed wrinkles, that day, in the corners of Chrysothemis's eyes. He thought, also, that her beauty was more celebrated in Rome than it deserved, and that Fontius Capiton, who had offered him three boys from Clazomene for Eunice, wanted to buy her too cheaply. Chapter 13 Next morning, Petronius had barely finished dressing in the Unctaurium when Venetius came, called by Tiresias. He knew that no news had come from the gates. This information, instead of comforting him, as a proof that Lygia was still in Rome, weighed him down still more, for he began to think that Ursus might have conducted her out of the city immediately after her seizure and hence before Petronius's slaves had begun to keep watch at the gates. It is true that in autumn, when the days become shorter, the gates are closed rather early, but it is true, also, that they are opened for persons going out, and the number of these is considerable. It was possible, also, to pass the walls by other ways, well known, for instance, to slaves who wished to escape from the city. Venetius had sent out his people to all roads leading to the provinces to watchmen in the smaller towns, proclaiming a pair of fugitive slaves, with a detailed description of Ursus and Lygia, coupled with the offer of a reward for seizing them. But it was doubtful whether that pursuit would reach the fugitives, and even should it reach them, whether the local authorities would feel justified in making the arrest at the private instance of Venetius, without the support of a praetor. Indeed, there had not been time to obtain such support. Venetius himself, disguised as a slave, had sought Lygia the whole day before, through every corner of the city, but had been unable to find the least indication or trace of her. He had seen Alice's servants, it is true, but they seemed to be seeking something also, and that confirmed him in the belief that it was not Alice who had intercepted the maiden, and that the old general did not know what had happened to her. When Tiresias announced to him, then, that there was a man who would undertake to find Lygia, he hurried with all speed to the house of Petronius, and barely had he finished saluting his uncle, when he inquired for the man. We shall see him at once, Eunice knows him, said Petronius. She will come this moment to arrange the folds of my toga, and will give nearer information concerning him. Oh, she whom thou hadst the wish to bestow on me yesterday? The one whom thou didst reject, for which I am grateful, for she is the best vestiplica in the whole city. In fact, the Vestiplica came in before he had finished speaking, and taking the toga, laid on a chair and laid with pearl, she opened the garment to throw it on Petronius's shoulder. Her face was clear and calm, joy was in her eyes. Petronius looked at her. She seemed to him very beautiful. After a while, when she had covered him with the toga, she began to arrange it, bending at times to lengthen the folds. He noticed that her arms had a marvelous pale rose color and her bosom and shoulders the transparent reflections of pearl or alabaster. Eunice, said he, has the man come to Tiresias whom thou didst mention yesterday? He has, Lord. What is his name? Shiloh Chilonides. Who is he? A physician, a sage, a soothsayer, who knows how to read people's fates and predict the future. Has he predicted the future to thee? Eunice was covered with a blush which gave a rosy color to her ears and her neck even. Yes. Lord, what has he predicted? That pain and happiness would meet me. Pain met thee yesterday at the hands of Tiresias, hence happiness also should come. It has come, Lord, already. What? I remain, said she in a whisper. Petronius put his hand on her golden head. Thou hast arranged the folds well today, and I am satisfied with thee, Eunice. Under that touch her eyes were mist covered in one instant from happiness and her bosom began to heave quickly. Petronius and Venetius passed into the atrium, where Shiloh Chilonides was waiting. When he saw them, he made a low bow. A smile came to the lips of Petronius at thought of his suspicion of yesterday, that this man might be Eunice's lover. The man who was standing before him could not be anyone's lover. In that marvelous figure there was something both foul and ridiculous. He was not old. In his dirty beard and curly locks a gray hair shone here and there. He had a lank stomach and stooping shoulders, so that at the first cast of the eye he appeared to be hunchbacked. Above that hump rose a large head, with the face of a monkey and also of a fox. The eye was penetrating. His yellowish complexion was varied with pimples, and his nose, covered with them completely, might indicate too great a love for the bottle. His neglected apparel, 
composed of a dark tunic of goat's wool and a mantle of similar material with holes in it, showed real or simulated poverty. At sight of him, Homer's thersites came to the mind of Petronius. Hence, answering with a wave of the hand to his bow, he said, dash, a greeting, divine thersites. How are the lumps which Ulysses gave thee at Troy, and what is he doing himself in the Elysian fields? Noble lord, answered Shiloh Chilonides, Ulysses, the wisest of the dead, sends a greeting through me to Petronius, the wisest of the living, and the request to cover my lumps with a new mantle. By Hecate Triformis, exclaimed Petronius, the answer deserves a new mantle. But further conversation was interrupted by the impatient Venetius, who inquired directly, Dost thou know clearly what thou art undertaking, when two households and two lordly mansions speak of naught else? And when half Rome is repeating the news, it is not difficult to know, answered Shiloh. The night before last a maiden named Lygia, but specially Kalina, and reared in the house of Alice Plautius, was intercepted. Thy slaves were conducting her, O Lord, from Caesar's palace to thy insula, and I undertake to find her in the city, or, if she has left the city which is little likely to indicate to thee, noble tribune, whither she has fled and where she has hidden. That is well said Venetius, who was pleased with the precision of the answer. What means hast thou to do this? Shiloh smiled cunningly. Thou hast the means, Lord, I have the wit only. Petronius smiled also, for he was perfectly satisfied with his guest. That man can find the maiden, thought he. Meanwhile Venetius wrinkled his joined brows, and said, Wretch, in case thou deceive me for gain, I will give command to beat thee with clubs. I am a philosopher, Lord and a philosopher cannot be greedy of gain, especially of such as thou hast just offered magnanimously. Oh, art thou a philosopher? inquired Petronius. Eunice told me that thou art a physician and a soothsayer. Whence knowest thou Eunice? She came to me frayed, for my fame struck her ears. What aid did she want? Aid in love, Lord. She wanted to be cured of unrequited love. Didst thou cure her? I did more, Lord. I gave her an amulet which secures mutuality. In Paphos, on the island of Cyprus, is a temple, O Lord, in which is preserved a zone of Venus. I gave her two threads from that zone, enclosed in an almond shell. And didst thou make her pay well for them? One can never pay enough for mutuality. And I, who lack two fingers on my right hand, am collecting money to buy a slave copyist to write down my thoughts, and preserve my wisdom for mankind. Of what school art thou, divine sage? I am a cynic, Lord because I wear a tattered mantle, I am a stoic, because I bear poverty patiently, I am a peripatetic, for, not owning a litter, I go on foot from one wine shop to another, and on the way teach those who promise to pay for a pitcher of wine, and at the pitcher thou dost become a reader, Heraclitus declares that all is fluid, and canst thou deny, Lord, that wine is fluid, and he declared that fire is a divinity, divinity, therefore, is blushing in thy nose. But the divine Diogenes from Apollonia declared that air is the essence of things, and the warmer the air the more perfect the beings it makes, and from the warmest come the souls of sages. And since the autumns are cold, a genuine sage should warm his soul with wine, and wouldst thou hinder, O Lord, a pitcher of even the stuff produced in Capua or Telesia from bearing heed to all the bones of a perishable human body? Shiloh Chilonides. Where is thy birthplace? On the Euxine Pontus. I come from Misambria. Oh, Shiloh, thou art great and unrecognized, said the sage, pensively. But Venetius was impatient again. In view of the hope which had gleamed before him, he wished Shiloh to set out at once on his work. Hence the whole conversation seemed to him simply a vain loss of time, and he was angry at Petronius. When wilt thou begin the search? asked he, turning to the Greek. I have begun it already answered Shiloh, and since I am here, and answering thy affable question, I am searching yet. Only have confidence, honored tribune, and know that if thou wert to lose the string of thy sandal I should find it, or him who picked it up on the street. Hast thou been employed in similar services? asked Petronius. The Greek raised his eyes. Today men esteem virtue and wisdom too low, for a philosopher not to be forced to seek other means of living. What are thy means? To know everything and to serve those with news who are in need of it, and who pay for it. Ah, Lord, 
I need to buy a copyist, otherwise my wisdom will perish with me. If thou hast not collected enough yet to buy a sound mantle, thy services cannot be very famous. Modesty hinders me. But remember, Lord, that today there are not such benefactors as were numerous formerly, and for whom it was as pleasant to cover service with gold as to swallow an oyster from Puteoli. No, my services are not small, but the gratitude of mankind is small. At times, when a valued slave escapes, who will find him, if not the only son of my father? When on the walls there are inscriptions against the divine Papia, who will indicate those who composed them? Who will discover as the book stalls verses against Caesar? Who will declare what is said in the houses of knights and senators? Who will carry letters which the writers will not entrust to slaves? Who will listen to news at the doors of barbers? For whom have wine shops and bake shops no secret? In whom do slaves trust? Who can see through every house, from the atrium to the garden? Who knows every street, every alley and hiding place? Who knows what they say in the baths, in the circus? in the markets, in the fencing schools, in slave dealers' sheds, and even in the arenas, by the gods. Enough, noble sage, cried Petronius, we are drowning in thy services, thy virtue, thy wisdom, and thy eloquence. Enough. We wanted to know who thou art, and we know. But Venetius was glad, for he thought that this man, like a hound, once put on the trail, would not stop till he had found out the hiding place. Well, said he, Dost thou need indications? I need arms. Of what kind? Asked Venetius, with astonishment. The Greek stretched out one hand, with the other he made the gesture of counting money. Such are the times, Lord, said he, with a sigh. Thou wilt be the ass, then, said Petronius, to win the fortress with bags of gold. I am only a poor philosopher, answered Shiloh, with humility, ye have the gold. Venetius tossed him a purse, which the Greek caught in the air though two fingers were lacking on his right hand. He raised his head then, and said, I know more than thou thinkest. I have not come empty-handed. I know that Alice did not intercept the maiden, for I have spoken with his slaves. I know that she is not on the Palatine, for all are occupied with the infant Augusta, and perhaps I may even divine why ye prefer to search for the maiden with my help rather than that of the city guards and Caesar's soldiers. I know that her escape was effected by a servant a slave coming from the same country as she. He could not find assistance among slaves, for slaves all stand together, and would not act against thy slaves. Only a core religionist would help him. Thus here, Venetius, broken Petronius, have I not said the same, word for word, to thee? That is an honor for me, said Shiloh. The maiden, Lord, continued he, turning again to Venetius, worships beyond a doubt the same divinity as that most virtuous of Roman ladies, that genuine matron, Pomponia. I have heard this, too, that Pomponia was tried in her own house for worshipping some kind of foreign god, but I could not learn from her slaves what god that is, or what his worshippers are called. If I could learn that, I should go to them, become the most devoted among them, and gain their confidence. But thou, Lord, who hast passed, as I know too, a number of days in the house of the noble Alice, Canst thou not give me some information thereon? I cannot, said Venetius. Ye have asked me long about various things, noble lords, and I have answered the questions. Permit me now to give one. Hast thou not seen, honored tribune, some statuette, some offering, some token, some amulet on Pomponia or thy divine Lygia? Hast thou not seen them making signs to each other, intelligible to them alone? Signs? Wait. Yes. I saw once that Lygia made a fish on the sand. A fish? A A O O O. Did she do that once, or a number of times? Only once. And art thou certain, Lord, that she outlined a fish? O oh, O? Oh. Yes, answered Venetius, with roused curiosity. Dost thou divine what that means? Do I divine? exclaimed Shiloh. And bowing in sign of farewell, he added, May fortune scatter on you both equally all gifts. Worthy lords, give command to bring thee a mantle, said Petronius to him at parting. Ulysses gives thee thanks for thirsites, said the Greek, and bowing a second time, he walked out. What wilt thou say of that noble sage? inquired Petronius. This, that he will find Lygia, answered Venetius, with delight, but I will say, too, that were there a kingdom of rogues he might be the king of it. Most certainly. I shall make a nearer acquaintance with this stoic 
Meanwhile I must give command to perfume the atrium. But Shiloh Chilonides, wrapping his new mantle about him, threw up on his palm, under its folds, the purse received from Venetius, and admired both its weight and its jingle. Walking on slowly, and looking around to see if they were not looking at him from the house, he passed the portico of Livia, and, reaching the corner of the Clivus Verbius, turned toward the Sabura. I must go to Sporus, said he to himself and pour out a little wine to Fortuna. I have found at last what I have been seeking this long time. He is young, irascible, bounteous as mines in Cyprus, and ready to give half his fortune for that Lygian linnet. Just such a man have I been seeking this long time. It is needful, however, to be on one's guard with him, for the wrinkling of his brow forebodes no good. Ah, the wolf whelps lord it over the world today. I should fear that Petronius less. O oh gods. But the trade of procurer pays better at present than virtue. Ah, she drew a fish on the sand. If I know what that means, may I choke myself with a piece of goat's cheese. But I shall know. Fish live underwater, and searching underwater is more difficult than on land. Ergo he will pay me separately for this fish, another such purse and I might cast aside the beggar's wallet and buy myself a slave. But what wouldst thou say, Shiloh, were I to advise thee to buy not a male but a female slave? I know thee, I know that thou wouldst consent. If she were beautiful, like Eunice, for instance, thou thyself wouldst grow young near her and at the same time would have from her a good and certain income. I sold to that poor Eunice two threads from my old mantle. She is dull, but if Petronius were to give her to me, I would take her. Yes, yes, Shiloh Chilonides, thou hast lost father and mother, thou art an orphan, therefore buy to console thee even a female slave. She must indeed live somewhere, therefore Venetius will hire her a dwelling, in which thou too mayest find shelter. She must dress, Hence Venetius will pay for the dress, and must eat, hence he will support her. Ach, what a hard life! Where are the times in which for a nobilis a man could buy as much pork and beans as he could hold in both hands, or a piece of goat centrails as long as the arm of a boy twelve years old, and filled with blood? But here is that villain Sporus. In the wine shop it will be easier to learn something. Thus conversing. He entered the wine shop and ordered a pitcher of dark for himself. Seeing the skeptical look of the shopkeeper, he took a gold coin from his purse, and, putting it on the table, said, Sporus, I toiled today with Seneca from dawn till midday, and this is what my friend gave me at parting. The plump eyes of Sporus became plumper still at this sight, and the wine was soon before Shiloh. Moistening his fingers in it, he drew a fish on the table, and said, Knowest what that means? A fish? Well, a fish, yes, that's a fish. Thou art dull, though thou dost add so much water to the wine that thou mightst find a fish in it. This is a symbol which, in the language of philosophers, means the smile of fortune. If thou hadst divined it, thou too mightst have made a fortune. Honor philosophy, I tell thee, or I shall change my wine shop, an act to which Petronius, my personal friend, has been urging me this long time. Chapter 14 For a number of days after the interview, Shiloh did not show himself anywhere. Venetius, since he had learned from Octay that Lygia loved him, was a hundred times more eager to find her, and began himself to search. He was unwilling, and also unable, to ask aid of Caesar, who was in great fear because of the illness of the infant Augusta. Sacrifices in the temples did not help, neither did prayers and offerings, nor the art of physicians nor all the means of enchantment to which they turned finally. In a week the child died. Morning fell upon the court and Rome. Caesar, who at the birth of the infant was wild with delight, was wild now from despair, and, confining himself in his apartments, refused food for two days, and though the palace was swarming with senators and Augustines, who hastened with marks of sorrow and sympathy, he denied audience to everyone. The senate assembled in an extraordinary session at which the dead child was pronounced divine. It was decided to rear to her a temple and appoint a special priest to her service. New sacrifices were offered in other temples in honor of the deceased, statues of her were cast from precious metals, and her funeral was one immense solemnity, during which the people wondered at the unrestrained marks of grief which Caesar exhibited. They wept with him, stretched out their hands for gifts, and above all amused themselves with the unparalleled spectacle. That death alarmed Petronius. All knew in Rome that Papia ascribed it to enchantment. The physicians, 
who were thus enabled to explain the vanity of their efforts, supported her. The priests, whose sacrifices proved powerless, did the same, as well as the sorcerers, who were trembling for their lives, and also the people. Petronius was glad now that Lygia had fled, for he wished no evil to Alice and Pomponia, and he wished good to himself and Vinicius. Therefore when the Cyprus, set out before the Palatine as a sign of mourning, was removed, he went to the reception appointed for the senators and Augustines to learn how far Nero had lent ear to reports of spells, and to neutralize results which might come from his belief. Knowing Nero, he thought, too, that though he did not believe in charms, he would feign belief, so as to magnify his own suffering, and take vengeance on someone. Finally, to escape the suspicion that the gods had begun to punish him for crimes, Petronius did not think that Caesar could love really and deeply even his own child. Though he loved her passionately, he felt certain, however, that he would exaggerate his suffering. He was not mistaken. Nero listened, with stony face and fixed eyes, to the consolation offered by knights and senators. It was evident that, even if he suffered, he was thinking of this. What impression would his suffering make upon others? He was posing as a naiabe, and giving an exhibition of parental sorrow, as an actor would give it on the stage. He had not the power even then to endure in his silent and as it were petrified sorrow, for at moments he made a gesture as if to cast the dust of the earth on his head, and at moments he groaned deeply, but seeing Petronius, he sprang up and cried in a tragic voice, so that all present could hear him, Ehu, and thou art guilty of her death. At thy advice the evil spirit entered these walls, the evil spirit which, with one look, drew the life from her breast. Woe is me! Would that my eyes had not seen the light of Helios! Woe is me! Ehu! Ehu! And raising his voice still more, he passed into a despairing shout, but Petronius resolved at that moment to put everything on one cast of the dice. Hence, stretching out his hand, he seized the silk kerchief which Nero wore around his neck always, and, placing it on the mouth of the imperator, said solemnly, Lord, Rome and the world are benumbed with pain, but do thou preserve thy voice for us. Those present were amazed, Nero himself was amazed for a moment, Petronius alone was unmoved, he knew too well what he was doing. He remembered, besides, that Terpnaz and Diodorus had a direct order to close Caesar's mouth whenever he raised his voice too much and exposed it to danger. O oh, Caesar, continued he, with the same seriousness and sorrow, we have suffered an immeasurable loss, let even this treasure of consolation remain to us. Nero's face quivered, and after a while tears came from his eyes. All at once he rested his hands on Petronius's shoulders, and, dropping his head on his breast, began to repeat, amid sobs, Thou alone. Of all thought of this, thou alone, O Petronius, thou alone. Tigellinus grew yellow from envy, but Petronius continued, Dash, go to Andium. There she came to the world, their joy flowed in on thee, their solace will come to thee. Let the sea air freshen thy divine throat, let thy breast breathe the salt dampness. We, thy devoted ones, will follow thee everywhere, and when we assuage thy pain with friendship, thou wilt comfort us with song. True, answered Nero, sadly, I will write a hymn in her honor and compose music for it, and then thou wilt find the warm sun in Bai, and afterward forgetfulness in Greece, in the birthplace of poetry and song. And his stony, gloomy state of mind passed away gradually, as clouds pass that are covering the sun, and then a conversation began which, though full of sadness, yet was full of plans for the future, touching a journey, artistic exhibitions, and even the receptions required at the promised coming of Tiridates. King of Armenia. Tigellinus tried, it is true, to bring forward again the enchantment, but Petronius, sure now of victory, took up the challenge directly. Tigellinus, said he, dost thou think that enchantments can injure the gods? Caesar himself has mentioned them, answered the courtier. Pain was speaking, not Caesar, but thou what is thy opinion of the matter? The gods are too mighty to be subject to charms. Then wouldst thou deny divinity to Caesar and his family? Practum A, muttered Eprius Marcellus, standing near, repeating that shout which the people gave always when the gladiator in the arena received such a blow that he needed no other. Tigellinus gnawed his own anger. Between him and Petronius there had long existed a rivalry touching Nero. Tigellinus had this superiority, that Nero acted with less ceremony 
or rather with none whatever in his presence, while thus far Petronius overcame Tigellinus at every encounter with wit and intellect. So it happened now. Tigellinus was silent, and simply recorded in his memory those senators and knights who, when Petronius withdrew to the depth of the chamber, surrounded him straightway, supposing that after this incident he would surely be Caesar's first favorite. Petronius, on leaving the palace, betook himself to Venetius, and described his encounter with Caesar and Tigellinus. Not only have I turned away danger, said he, from Malus Plautius, Pomponia, and us, but even from Lygia, whom they will not seek, even for this reason, that I have persuaded Bronzebeard, the monkey, to go to Antium, and thence to Naples or Baiae, and he will go. I know that he has not ventured yet to appear in the theatre publicly. I have known this long time that he intends to do so at Naples. He is dreaming, moreover, of Greece, where he wants to sing in all the more prominent cities, and then make a triumphal entry into Rome, with all the crowns which the Gerculi will bestow on him. During that time we shall be able to seek Lygian unhindered and secrete her in safety. But has not our noble philosopher been here yet? Thy noble philosopher is a cheat. No, he has not shown himself and he will not show himself again. But I have a better understanding, if not of his honesty, of his wit. He has drawn blood once from thy purse, and will come even for this, to draw it a second time. Let him beware lest I draw his own blood. Draw it not, have patience till thou art convinced surely of his deceit. Do not give him more money, but promise a liberal reward if he brings thee certain information. Wilt thou thyself undertake something? My two freedmen, Nymphidius and Demas are searching for her with sixty men. Freedom is promised the slave who finds her. Besides I have sent out special persons by all roads leading from Rome to inquire at every inn for the Lygian and the maiden. I course through the city myself day and night, counting on a chance meeting. Whenever thou hast tidings let me know, for I must go to Andium. I will do so. And if thou wake up some morning and say, It is not worthwhile to torment myself for one girl, and take so much trouble because of her come to Andium. There will be no lack of women there, or amusement. Venetius began to walk with quick steps. Petronius looked for some time at him, and said at last, Tell me sincerely, not as a mad head, who talks something into his brain and excites himself, but as a man of judgment who is answering a friend, art thou concerned as much as ever about this Lygia? Venetius stopped a moment, and looked at Petronius as if he had not seen him before. Then he began to walk again. It was evident that he was restraining an outburst. At last, from a feeling of helplessness, sorrow, anger, and invincible yearning, two tears gathered in his eyes, which spoke with greater power to Petronius than the most eloquent words. Then, meditating for a moment, he said, It is not Atlas who carries the world on his shoulders, but woman, and sometimes she plays with it as with a ball. True said Venetius, and they began to take farewell of each other. But at that moment a slave announced that Shiloh Chilonides was waiting in the antechamber, and begged to be admitted to the presence of the Lord. Venetius gave commands to admit him immediately, and Petronius said, Ha! Have I not told thee? By Hercules, keep thy calmness, or he will command thee, not thou him. A greeting and honor to the noble tribune of the army, and to thee, Lord, said Shiloh entering. May your happiness be equal to your fame, and may your fame course through the world from the pillars of Hercules to the boundaries of the Arsacide. A greeting, O lawgiver of virtue and wisdom, answered Petronius. But Venetius inquired with affected calmness, What dost thou bring? The first time I came I brought thee hope, O Lord, at present, I bring certainty that the maiden will be found. That means that thou hast not found her yet? Yes, Lord. But I have found what that sign means which she made. I know who the people are who rescued her, and I know the God among whose worshippers to seek her. Venetius wished to spring from the chair in which he was sitting, but Petronius placed his hand on his shoulder, and turning to Shiloh said, Speak on. Art thou perfectly certain, Lord, that she drew a fish on the sand? Yes, burst out Venetius. Then she is a Christian and Christians carried her away. A moment of silence followed. Listen, Shiloh said Petronius. My relative has predestined to thee a considerable sum of money for finding the girl, but a no less considerable number of rods if thou deceive him. In the first case thou wilt purchase not one, but three scribes, in the second, 
the philosophy of all the seven sages, with the addition of thy own, will not suffice to get thee ointment. The maiden is a Christian, Lord, cried the Greek. Stop, Shiloh, thou art not a dull man. We know that Unia and Calvia Crispinilla accused Pomponia Grecina of confessing the Christian superstition, but we know too, that a domestic court acquitted her. Wouldst thou raise this again? Wouldst thou persuade us that Pomponia, and with her Lygia, could belong to the enemies of the human race, to the poisoners of wells and fountains, to the worshippers of an ass's head, to people who murder infants and give themselves up to the foulest license? Think, Shiloh, if that thesis which thou art announcing to us will not rebound as an antithesis on thy own back. Shiloh spread out his arms in sign that that was not his fault, and then said, Lord, utter in Greek the following sentence, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour. Iasus Christos, Theuios, Soter. Well, I have uttered it. What comes of that? Now take the first letters of each of those words and put them into one word. Fish, said Petronius with astonishment. Ichthus, the Greek word for fish. There, that is why fish has become the watchword of the Christians, answered Shiloh, proudly. A moment of silence followed. But there was something so striking in the conclusions of the Greek that the two friends could not guard themselves from amazement. Venetius, art thou not mistaken? asked Petronius. Did Lygia really draw a fish for thee? By all the infernal gods, one might go mad, cried the young man, with excitement. If she had drawn a bird for me, I should have said a bird. Therefore she is a Christian, repeated Shiloh. This signifies, said Petronius, that Pomponia and Lygia poison wells, murder children caught on the street, and give themselves up to dissoluteness. Folly. Thou, Venetius, wert at their house for a time, I was there a little while, but I know Pomponia and Alice enough, I know even Lygia enough, to say monstrous and foolish. If a fish is the symbol of the Christians, which it is difficult really to deny, and if those women are Christians, then, by Proserpina. Evidently Christians are not what we hold them to be. Thou speakest like Socrates, Lord, answered Shiloh, who has ever examined a Christian, who has learned their religion. When I was traveling three years ago from Naples hither to Rome, oh, why did I not stay in Naples? A man joined me, whose name was Glaucus, of whom people said that he was a Christian, but in spite of that I convinced myself that he was a good and virtuous man. Was it not from that virtuous man that thou hast learned now what the fish means? Unfortunately, Lord, on the way, at an inn, someone thrust a knife into that honorable old man, and his wife and child were carried away by slave dealers. I lost in their defense these two fingers, since, as people say, there is no lack among Christians of miracles, I hope that the fingers will grow out on my hand again. How is that? Hast thou become a Christian? Since yesterday, Lord, since yesterday, the fish made me a Christian. But see what a power there is in it. For some days I shall be the most zealous of the zealous, so that they may admit me to all their secrets, and when they admit me to their secrets, I shall know where the maiden is hiding. Perhaps then my Christianity will pay me better than my philosophy. I have made a vow also to Mercury, that if he helps me to find the maiden, I will sacrifice to him two heifers of the same size and color and will gild their horns. Then thy Christianity of yesterday and thy philosophy of long-standing permit thee to believe in Mercury? I believe always in that in which I need to believe, that is my philosophy, which ought to please Mercury. Unfortunately, ye know. Worthy lords, what a suspicious god he is. He does not trust the promises even of blameless philosophers, and prefers the heifers in advance. Meanwhile this outlay is immense. Not everyone is a Seneca, and I cannot afford the sacrifice. Should the noble Venetius, however, wish to give something, on account of that sum which he promised. Not an obelisk, Shiloh, said Petronius, not an obelisk. The bounty of Venetius will surpass thy expectations. But only when Lygia is found, that is, when thou shalt indicate to us her hiding place. Mercury must trust thee for the two heifers, though I am not astonished at him for not wishing to do so, in this I recognize his acuteness. Listen to me, worthy lords. The discovery which I have made is great, for though I have not found the maiden yet, I have found the way in which I must seek her. Ye have sent freedmen and slaves throughout the city and into the country. Has any one given you a clue? No, I alone have given one. I tell you more. Among your slaves there may be Christians, of whom ye have no knowledge, for this superstition has spread everywhere, 
and they, instead of aiding, will betray you. It is unfortunate that they see me here. Do thou therefore, noble Petronius, enjoin silence on Eunice, and thou too, noble Venetius, spread a report that I sell the anointment which ensures victory in the circus to horses rubbed with it. I alone will search for her, and single-handed I will find the fugitives, and do ye trust in me, and know that whatever I receive in advance will be for me simply an encouragement, for I shall hope always for more and shall feel the greater certainty that the promised reward will not fail me. Ah, it is true. As a philosopher I despise money, though neither Seneca, nor even Musonius, nor Cornutus despises it, though they have not lost fingers in any one's defense, and are able themselves to write and leave their names to posterity. But, aside from the slave, whom I intend to buy, and besides Mercury, to whom I have promised the heifers, and ye know how dear cattle have become in these times, the searching itself involves much outlay. Only listen to me patiently. Well, for the last few days my feet are wounded from continual walking. I have gone to wine shops to talk with people, to bakeries, to butcher shops, to dealers in olive oil, and to fishermen. I have run through every street and alley, I have been in the hiding places of fugitive slaves, I have lost money, nearly a hundred asses, in playing Mara. I have been in laundries, in drying sheds, in cheap kitchens, I have seen mule drivers and carvers, I have seen people who cure bladder complaints and pull teeth, I have talked with dealers in dried figs, I have been at cemeteries, and do ye know why? This is why, so as to outline a fish everywhere, look people in the eyes, and hear what they would say of that sign. For a long time I was unable to learn anything till at last I saw an old slave at a fountain. He was drawing water with a bucket, and weeping. Approaching him, I asked the cause of his tears. When we had sat down on the steps of the fountain, he answered that all his life he had been collecting sestertium after sestertium, to redeem his beloved son, but his master, a certain pansa, when the money was delivered to him, took it, but kept the son in slavery. And so I am weeping, said the old man, for though I repeat, let the will of God be done, I, poor sinner, am not able to keep down my tears. Then, as if penetrated by a forewarning, I moistened my finger in the water and drew a fish for him. To this he answered, My hope, too, is in Christ. I asked him then, Hast thou confessed to me by that sign? I have, said he, and peace be with thee. I began then to draw him out, and the honest old man told me everything. His master, that pansa, is himself a freedman of the great Pansa, and he brings stones by the Tiber to Rome, where slaves and hired persons unload them from the boats, and carry them to buildings in the night time, so as not to obstruct movement in the streets during daylight. Among these people many Christians work, and also his son, as the work is beyond his son's strength, he wished to redeem him. But Pansa preferred to keep both the money and the slave. While telling me this, he began again to weep and I mingled my tears with his, tears came to me easily because of my kind heart, and the pain in my feet, which I got from walking excessively. I began also to lament that as I had come from Naples only a few days since, I knew no one of the brotherhood, and did not know where they assembled for prayer. He wondered that Christians in Naples had not given me letters to their brethren in Rome, but I explained to him that the letters were stolen from me on the road. Then he told me to come to the river at night and he would acquaint me with brethren who would conduct me to houses of prayer and to elders who govern the Christian community. When I heard this, I was so delighted that I gave him the sum needed to redeem his son, in the hope that the lordly Venetius would return it to me twofold. Shiloh, interrupted Petronius, in thy narrative falsehood appears on the surface of truth, as oil does on water. Thou hast brought important information, I do not deny that. I assert, even that a great step is made toward finding Lygia, but do not cover thy news with falsehood. What is the name of that old man from whom thou hast learned that the Christians recognize each other through the sign of a fish? Eurysius, a poor, unfortunate old man, he reminded me of Glaucus, whom I defended from murderers, and he touched me mainly by this. I believe that thou didst discover him, and wilt be able to make use of the acquaintance, but thou hast given him no money. Thou hast not given him an as, dost understand me? Thou hast not given anything. But I helped him to lift the bucket, and I spoke of his son with the greatest sympathy. Yes, Lord, what can hide before the penetration of Petronius? Well, I did not give him money, 
or rather, I gave it to him, but only in spirit, in intention, which, had he been a real philosopher, should have sufficed him. I gave it to him because I saw that such an act was indispensable and useful, for think, Lord, how this act has won all the Christians at once to me, what access to them it has opened, and what confidence it has roused in them. True, said Petronius, and it was thy duty to do it. For this very reason I have come to get the means to do it. Petronius turned to Vinicius, give command to count out to him five thousand sestertia, but in spirit, in intention. I will give thee a young man, said Vinicius, who will take the sum necessary. Thou wilt say to Eurysius that the youth is thy slave, and thou wilt count out to the old man, in the youth's presence, this money. Since thou hast brought important tidings, Thou wilt receive the same amount for thyself. Come for the youth and the money this evening. Thou art a real Caesar, said Shiloh. Permit me, Lord, to dedicate my work to thee, but permit also that this evening I come only for the money, since Eurysius told me that all the boats had been unloaded, and that new ones would come from Ostia only after some days. Peace be with you. Thus do Christians take farewell of one another. I will buy myself a slave woman. That is, I wanted to say a slave man. Fish are caught with a bait, and Christians with fish. Fax vobis cum. Pax, pax, pax. Chapter 15 Petronius to Venetius, I send to thee from Antium, by a trusty slave, this litter, to which, though thy hand is more accustomed to the sword and the javelin than the pen, I think that thou wilt answer through the same messenger without needless delay. I left thee on a good trail, and full of hope. Hence I trust that thou hast either satisfied thy pleasant desires in the embraces of Lygia, or wilt satisfy them before the real wintry wind from the summits of Seract shall blow on the Campania. Oh, my Venetius, may thy preceptress be the golden goddess of Cyprus, be thou, on thy part, the preceptor of that Lygian Aurora, who is fleeing before the sun of love. And remember always that marble, though most precious, is nothing of itself and acquires real value only when the sculptor's hand turns it into a masterpiece. Be thou such a sculptor, Kirisim. To love is not sufficient, one must know how to love, one must know how to teach love. Though the plebs, too, and even animals, experience pleasure, a genuine man differs from them in this especially, that he makes love in some way a noble art, and, admiring it, knows all its divine value, makes it present in his mind thus satisfying not his body merely, but his soul. More than once, when I think here of the emptiness, the uncertainty, the dreariness of life, it occurs to me that perhaps thou hast chosen better, and that not Caesar's court, but war and love, are the only objects for which it is worthwhile to be born and to live. Thou wert fortunate in war, be fortunate also in love, and if thou art curious as to what men are doing at the court of Caesar, I will inform thee from time to time. We are living here at Antium, and nursing our heavenly voice, we continue to cherish the same hatred of Rome, and think of betaking ourselves to Baiae for the winter, to appear in public at Naples, whose inhabitants, being Greeks, will appreciate us better than that wolf brood on the banks of the Tiber. People will hasten thither from Baiae, from Pompeii, Puteoli, come, and Stabia, neither applause nor crowns will be lacking and that will be an encouragement for the proposed expedition to Achaea. But the memory of the infant Augusta? Yes, we are bewailing her yet. We are singing hymns of our own composition, so wonderful that the sirens have been hiding from envy in Amphitrite's deepest caves. But the dolphins would listen to us, were they not prevented by the sound of the sea. Our suffering is not delayed yet, hence we will exhibit it to the world in every form which sculpture can employ and observe carefully if we are beautiful in our suffering and if people recognize this beauty. Oh, my dear, we shall die buffoons and comedians. All the Augustines are here, male and female, not counting ten thousand servants, and five hundred she-asses, in whose milk Poppy bathes. At times even it is cheerful here. Calvia Crispinella is growing old. It is said that she has begged Poppy to let her take the bath immediately after herself. Luke can slap Nigidia on the face because he suspected her of relations with a gladiator. Sporus lost his wife at dies to Cynicia. Torquatus Solanus has offered me for Eunice four chestnut horses, which this year will win the prize beyond doubt. I would not accept, thanks to thee, also, that thou didst not take her. As to Torquatus Solanus, 
The poor man does not even suspect that he is already more a shade than a man. His death is decided. And knowest what his crime is? He is the great grandson of the deified Augustus. There is no rescue for him. Such is our world. As is known to thee, we have been expecting Tiridates here. Meanwhile Vologesus has written an offensive letter. Because he has conquered Armenia, he asks that it be left to him for Tiridates. If not, he will not yield it in any case. Pure comedy. So we have decided on war. Corbillo will receive power such as Pompeius Magnus received in the war with pirates. There was a moment, however, when Nero hesitated. He seems afraid of the glory which Corbillo will win in case of victory. It was even thought to offer the chief command to Aralus. This was opposed by Papia for whom evidently Pomponia's virtue is as salt in the eye. Vadinius described to us a remarkable fight of gladiators, which is to take place in Beneventum. See to what cobblers rise in our time. In spite of the saying, ni suter ultra crepitam. Vitlius is the descendant of a cobbler, but Vadinius is the son of one. Perhaps he drew thread himself. The actor Alatrus represented Oedipus yesterday wonderfully. I asked him, by the way, as a Jew, if Christians and Jews were the same, he answered that the Jews have an eternal religion, but that Christians are a new sect risen recently in Judea, that in the time of Tiberius the Jews crucified a certain man, whose adherents increased daily, and that the Christians consider him as God. They refuse, it seems, to recognize other gods, ours especially. I cannot understand what harm it would do them to recognize these gods. Tigellinus shows me open enmity now. So far he is unequal to me. But he is, superior in this, that he cares more for life, and is at the same time a greater scoundrel, which brings him nearer a Hannibarbus. These two will understand each other earlier or later, and then my turn will come. I know not when it will come, but I know this, that as things are it must come, hence let time pass. Meanwhile we must amuse ourselves. Life of itself would not be bad were it not for Bronzebeard, thanks to him. A man at times is disgusted with himself. It is not correct to consider the struggle for his favor as a kind of rivalry in a circus, as a kind of game, as a struggle, in which victory flatters vanity. True, I explain it to myself in that way frequently, but still it seems to me sometimes that I am like Shiloh, and better in nothing than he. When he ceases to be needful to thee, send him to me. I have taken a fancy to his edifying conversation. A greeting from me to thy divine Christian or rather beg her in my name not to be a fish to thee. Inform me of thy health, inform me of thy love, know how to love, teach how to love, and farewell. Venetius to Petronius, Lygia is not found yet. Were it not for the hope that I shall find her soon, thou wouldst not receive an answer, for when a man is disgusted with life, he has no wish to write letters. I wanted to learn whether Shiloh was not deceiving me, and at night when he came to get the money for Eurysius. I threw on a military mantle, and unobserved followed him and the slave whom I sent with him. When they reached the place, I watched from a distance, hidden behind a portico pillar, and convinced myself that Eurysius was not invented. Below, a number of tens of people were unloading stones from a spacious barge, and piling them up on the bank. I saw Shiloh approach them, and begin to talk with some old man who after a while fell at his feet. Others surrounded them with shouts of admiration. Before my eyes the boy gave a purse to Eurysius, who on seizing it began to pray with upraised hands, while at his side some second person was kneeling, evidently his son. Shiloh said something which I could not hear, and blessed the two who were kneeling, as well as others, making in the air signs in the form of a cross, which they honor apparently, for all bent their knees. The desire seized me to go among them and promised three such purses to him who would deliver to me Lygia, but I feared to spoil Shiloh's work, and after hesitating a moment went home. This happened at least twelve days after thy departure. Since then Shiloh has been a number of times with me. He says that he has gained great significance among the Christians, that if he has not found Lygia so far, it is because the Christians in Rome are innumerable, hence all are not acquainted with each person in their community and cannot know everything that is done in it. They are cautious, too, and in general reticent. He gives assurance, however, that when he reaches the elders, who are called presbyters, he will learn every secret. He has made the acquaintance of a number of these already, and has begun to inquire of them, though carefully, so as not to rouse suspicion by haste, 
and not to make the work still more difficult. Though it is hard to wait, though patience fails, I feel that he is right, and I wait. He learned, too, that they have places of meeting for prayer, frequently outside the city, in empty houses and even in sand pits. There they worship Christ, sing hymns, and have feasts. There are many such places. Shiloh supposes that Lygia goes purposely to different ones from Pomponia, so that the latter, in case of legal proceedings or an examination, might swear boldly that she knew nothing of Lygia's hiding place. It may be that the presbyters have advised caution. When Shiloh discovers those places, I will go with him, and if the gods let me see Lygia, I swear to thee by Jupiter that she will not escape my hands this time. I am thinking continually of those places of prayer. Shiloh is unwilling that I should go with him, he is afraid. But I cannot stay at home. I should know her at once, even in disguise or if veiled. They assemble in the night, but I should recognize her in the night even. I should know her voice and motions anywhere. I will go myself in disguise, and look at every person who goes in or out. I am thinking of her always, and shall recognize her. Shiloh is to come tomorrow, and we shall go. I will take arms. Some of my slaves sent to the provinces have returned empty-handed. But I am certain now that she is in the city, perhaps not far away even. I myself have visited many houses under pretext of renting them. She will fare better with me a hundred times, where she is, whole legions of poor people dwell. Besides, I shall spare nothing for her sake. Thou writest that I have chosen well, I have chosen suffering and sorrow. We shall go first to those houses which are in the city then beyond the gates. Hope looks for something every morning, otherwise life would be impossible. Thou sayest that one should know how to love. I knew how to talk of love to Lygia. But now I only yearn, I do nothing but wait for Shiloh. Life to me is unendurable in my own house. Farewell.